we can hear you now, Dino. Okay. Sorry, thanks. So, uh, where did I start from the beginning or did it? No, I'm sorry. Just carry on. Okay. So, okay, I'll just start from the uh, all registrants, please uh, mute your, your microphones. Um, any questions, please type your questions in the chat box and we will try and address or incorporate as many as we can during the panel discussion session. The session will be recorded and the link will be communicated to participants after the webinar and it'll uh, most likely be housed at the Grand River Hospital YouTube site. The event is accredited group learning uh, activities, section one, as defined by the uh, Maintenance of Certification Program of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and approved by the Canadian Association of Pathology. A feedback survey will be emailed to all registered participants and we welcome and appreciate them being completed and returned by all participants. Following on a quote by Charlie Mugger, show me the incentive and I will show you the outcome. So for the specialist physicians uh, who will be applying for the uh, 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 CME activity, there will be a section on the survey for you to write your RCPCS number. So the CME hours can be uploaded directly to Mainport. So the outcome is that we will get back the surveys from this cohort of our audience today. Sorry, I couldn't incentivize uh, uh, for the remainder of the, uh, registrants, but please uh, do send them in. All organizers and presenters of this webinar have all submitted conflict of interest declarations and no conflicts have been identified. We are nine months into the COVID pandemic and laboratory medicine has been front and center, especially with the regional and provincial collaborations and networks that have been built, provides us an opportunity to reflect on the need for transformation. Diagnostics is the glue which holds a high proficient healthcare system together. The notion of a hospital lab appears quaint and antiquated and unable to deal with the new realities and the needs of healthcare delivery as we have witnessed in this COVID pandemic. We already know populations flow through and across communities and they tend not to care about organizational walls. It is the objective of this webinar and panel discussion to start the discussion within the Ontario lab medicine community and the healthcare system as a whole and to better understand and hopefully embrace the transformational changes required for our new reality post COVID and the vision of hospital labs without walls and laboratory physician without borders. So it is my pleasure to present today's speaker, a dear colleague and dear friend, Dr. Sandip Sengupta. Sandip is the laboratory medical director for Kingston Health Sciences Center, Rockville General Hospital and Perth and Smiths Falls District Hospital. He is also the Deputy Head of Pathology for uh, Kingston Health Sciences Center and Professor of Pathology at Queen's University. He is past president of the Ontario Association of Pathologists and past president of the Canadian Association of uh, Pathologists. Dr. Sandip Singupta will now present. Over to you, Sandip. Thank you very much, Demo. So uh, just waiting for uh, the presentation to come up on the screen. And uh, uh, just and as I uh, want to thank everybody for uh, participating in this webinar, it uh, really is uh, born from uh, a conversation that uh, Demo and I have been having for quite a few months pre-pandemic, um, with regards to uh, how can we get uh, laboratory medicine in um, in uh, a, a, into a higher focus on the uh, provincial scene. So the uh, draft that uh, what you see before you shouldn't have that draft, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, just indicate when the next slide has to be. I don't have any conflicts or disclosures, so we can move to the next slide, please. So the objectives, I'm gonna speak as Demo mentioned for about uh, 30 minutes and then uh, turn it over to uh, Zach to lead our panel discussion, which I hope will be uh, very enlightening and will give us some, uh, an opportunity really to uh, take a deeper dive into some of the concepts that I hope to uh, talk about uh, briefly. So really what I hope to share with you is uh, really my views on uh, value in laboratory medicine based upon uh, 
best practices in the industry and what's happening to some extent south of the border, but of course infiltrating um, into Canada. There's a movement called Clinical Lab 2.0, which I'm going to be uh, speaking to as well. I'm going to use that as a springboard to uh, move into a conversation about how lab physicians and laboratorians in general can create new value for our regional healthcare ecosystems. In Ontario, we previously knew them as LINs, but the, you know we are we know that they're moving forward into a different direction, and uh, the theme will be population health management, which is really new for us in lab medicine but I think one that we need to embrace as we move forward. Finally, I want to talk, of course, about how COVID has provided some new opportunities for us to create new networks, especially between lab medicine and primary care uh, and within the new, uh, newly being formed Ontario Health teams. Next slide, please. Oh, that's weird. I just dialed into a Zoom call. Okay. So, uh, okay. I want to start by uh, looking, uh, stepping back a minute and looking at where we are and where we need to be going. So we all know the issues at hand with respect to performance. We continue to raise our game. We're improving our performance. We're always uh, trying to improve our access to care, the efficiency of care. We're, uh, we're improving our quality. Accreditation requirements are becoming more and more stringent and we have less money to do it with. In fact, uh, this past year, the OHA has identified a need for a 4.85% increase in, in uh, base budgets for hospitals in Ontario. And that really is, uh, is threatening our sustainability. We uh, cannot continue to practice business as usual. And all you have to do is look south of the border at a number of hospitals and health systems that are closing uh, following COVID. Uh, and uh, realize that we can't be too far behind, even in a public health system. Next slide, please. So uh, the previous uh, uh, diagram actually uh, is very similar to what many people look at as the value proposition or the value, what is value? And um, really, if you look at it, uh, it's all about access to care, patient satisfaction and outcomes to care divided by the cost. So that's what value is. And uh, that's really where uh, we'll be talking about in this presentation. Next slide, please. And uh, so the ecosystem, the healthcare ecosystem value can be measured in those terms, but the laboratory performance is also can be uh, looked at in terms of the traditional sort of uh, uh, service that we provide, improving our quality of service, but also in the area of utilization management and the newer theme of population management. So really, uh, we are looking at uh, the same similar kinds of uh, metrics, similar kinds of uh, performance type activities, also measured by cost. And so as we improve our services, the ecosystem that we serve improves and it's a positive reinforcement loop. Next slide, please. In fact, uh, Ontario Health has uh, a very similar sort of theme. If you look at what Ontario Health is doing, they have the quadruple aim, which includes population health, improve patient experience, decrease cost, and improve satisfaction uh, for, uh, for pro providers and staff. So really this is very similar to uh, what we're proposing in terms of increasing the value proposition. So the question is how will we in lab medicine be able to align ourselves to what Ontario Health is doing to improve our stakes and get ourselves into a better position? Next slide please. So I had the opportunity about uh, two or three years ago to participate in a symposium with a variety of speakers. And uh, one of them happened to be Fred Horn, who was a former Minister of Health for the province of Alberta. And uh, so Fred is sitting there next to me. Uh, he was actually, I, I found his uh, words to be really inspiring because 
even though as a uh, member, uh, the highest ranking member of his uh, health ministry, he was a strong proponent of the laboratory and saw the lab as a strategic partner in health systems improvement. And he made the comment that, you know, Canada is uh, a high per capita spender. And we've seen a number of uh, bar graphs and so forth over the years to show that kind of data. But our performance is really sort of middle of the pack. Um, also, you know, where we spend most of our money tends to be on hospitals, it tends to be on physicians and physician focused type activities. But um, most of our unmet need is in the community. So this serves as a real opportunity for those of us in lab medicine that want to expand into the community. And 5% of the population consumes 65% of the resources. So how can we, uh, through population health perhaps, look at serving a greater percentage of that population with some of those resources? Innovation, of course, is a, uh, is a key focus of discussion amongst decision makers. We see that at the federal level now with the dollars being spent on innovation. And uh, it's the idea of bringing innovation into Ontario healthcare that I'm most interested in. Uh, also important is the appropriate reallocation of resources. So we know that the dollars are finite, but uh, they can be reallocated. So we have to make the case how they can be better allocated in terms of serving the needs of the people that we, uh, of our patients and uh, of the general public. And finally, leadership and the ability to execute are in high demand. So not all of us will be the leaders, but those of us that want to be and that are in those positions need to step up to the plate. You and in this uh, context, I'm speaking to the okay. lab directors of Ontario in the first instance, but to many others. Next slide, please. So in, for, in, in making the case for the lab, uh, and these are some of actually Fred Horn's uh, comments, but they resonate clearly, certainly with me. And uh, he made the comment that the value proposition is the contribution that we in lab medicine can make to improving patient outcomes. And then by doing so, we can uh, improve the outcomes of the health system in general. And um, the focus should really be more on the demand side of management, you know, the demand for care, demand for better resources and allocation decisions, rather than on supply management. And finally, looking at lab as a really truly integral component of every care pathway. I mean, it almost becomes trite to say it when one wants to provide integrated care, but it, when we look at it, labs are involved in virtually every aspect of clinical decision making. Next slide, please. And this is uh, uh, to sort of uh, make that point a little bit uh, more strongly. Lab costs as a care uh, as a percentage of total spending is really quite low. You know, it can vary up to as much as five percent, but generally, two, three, four percent is about the limit. One to two percent in the U.S. Uh, and the downstream costs, though, can be quite significant. You, we all know about those test results that result in more drugs. Uh, more diagnostic procedures and so on, and not to mention the adverse events. So we have the opportunity really to create value by uh, controlling some of those downstream costs. Next slide, please. So how I got interested in this was really through the lab directorship role and getting tired of uh, people not really knowing what we do, you know, and uh, traditionally we're thought of as the black box in the basement, so to speak, and really want to step out of that, you know. We invite people into our labs, we try to get people to understand what we're doing, but more in the context of lab directorship and trying to really get people to, uh, the lab directors and uh, others in lab medicine uh, leadership positions to step up to the plate and take charge. And in this context, it'll be really about how we can, you know, step out of our comfort zone to speak more in the population health space, which is really up until now being really underpopulated by uh, physicians in general and lab physicians in particular. Next slide, please. So the, the, the project uh, Clinical Lab 2.0, which uh, I referred to in the introduction, is something that, uh, a term that was coined by a group of American health systems lab leaders, and you see a group of them here, 
Uh, it's called Project Santa Fe because it was actually in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where this project was born, where this first uh, symposium was held. And it was a really to provoke the lab industry, and I'm talking about you know, the hospital sector, the private sector, and so forth, to look at itself through a new value lens. And they, and they had the predicament. They said, well, if we stay the same, we will be commoditized. We will see our budget shrink and uh, you know, we will not be able to uh, be sustainable. So what they did is to create a number of projects that could deliver value, added value by doing different things, by measuring uh, patient outcomes and by measuring the overall uh, cost per healthcare encounter. And, you know, we have tons and tons of data, but it's actually, these are difficult things to do. Next slide, please. So the um, Clinical Lab 2.0, is really um, the notion that uh, lab professionals can play a key role in transforming from sick care to health care. And uh, this is being done by moving from a transactional approach, in which is, you know, somebody orders a test, we provide a result sort of thing, to a more integrative approach in which lab medicine is uh, involved in clinical decision making in a much more active sense. Next slide, please. So one of the uh, basic concepts in this, of course, is how do you measure this? The lab 2.0 definition is uh, moving away from the traditional quality over cost as a measure of value to measurable action over cost. So what exactly is measurable action? Well. Uh, there are different metrics. The ones that the, the, the founders of 2.0 chose to look at are things like risk stratification, the care gaps, looking at the high risk groups, what are the interventions that we're taking, what are the preventions that were made, uh, what costs were avoided, uh, and what financial risks uh, were uh, adjusted for. And uh, for the lack of time, I can't get into the details of this, but you know, there's a lots of metrics behind this. Next slide, please. So um, this is one of my favorite slides. Um, I like to think that uh, what we provide is uh, we're well out of the business of, pro we're not in the business of providing commodity. Uh, you know, we don't make widgets for a living. That's uh, basically it. We provide services, but the whole notion of 2.0 is that we got to do better than that. We got to, it's not just about providing the laboratory services. We got to provide patients with a better experience. We need to integrate ourselves into the continuum of care that is underway. And we do that to some extent, but we got to do it more. And we've got to collaborate at every opportunity. And it's these last few steps that really make the difference between 1.0 and 2.0. And make no mistake, it doesn't mean that we get away from what doing what we traditionally do. That is simply now just the baseline from which we start. We need to uh, raise our game and move to the next level. Otherwise, we risk being uh, put out of business, quite frankly. I mean, if you all you have to do is look uh, to the West, uh, breaking news this past week out of Alberta with the uh, cutbacks that are being proposed, including to many thousands, uh, 11,000 people altogether in the health industry, including several thousand in lab uh, labs. And, uh, you know, it's because governments are now thinking, well, you know, it's just a commodity, but, you know, they don't realize the value. So this is where we're trying to get to. We're trying to make them realize that this is part of medicine. Lab medicine is medicine. Next slide, please. So, this is a bit more of a complex slide, but the intent is to just to demonstrate the interoperabilities and the complexities of the whole process. You know, we uh, clinical decision making is a complex process. Uh, there's a lot of inputs and outputs that go on, strategic and operating decisions. But I, I've highlighted the population management piece, which is the one that I want to focus on today to improving the value uh, proposition. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the 
uh, I like to think in uh, the lab's role in population health as the guardians of population health. Now, it's in part because of the data that we have access to. Uh, there's a tremendous, we have access to patient data and also physician practices uh, through ordering data. And these are available through uh, data analytics and data uh, repositories. But this is, uh, these are just the foundational elements. There's much more activity that needs to be incorporated into uh, population health, including some of the elements that I've identified below. And it's integrating all of these components and uh, making sense out of them that can uh, really uh, help to drive down uh, costs and improve healthcare and improve, move more from the sick care to the wealth care component. Next slide, please. So that, where we'd like to go is uh, a shift to the left. So this curve shows um, where we tend to spend most of our uh, resources, our time, our effort. Um, you know, the old adage, 20% of the population generates 80% of the cost is probably true. Uh, where we want to go is more into the people that are at risk or at, at least at high risk and identify those people so that they don't get into that uh, end of life or to the chronic disease progression stage. And through lab medicine, we have the tools to do that. We just need to be at the tables and to be convince others that these are the right things to do. Next slide, please. Uh, back, yeah, so this is one example. So uh, where we can make proactive interventions through the laboratory to affect chronic disease management. You know, there's a number of these entities. Diabetes is, you know, the sort of the poster child of this all, where lab data through things like the, the hemoglobin A1C, for example, can help to identify patients that are in high risk groups. Uh, we can uh, identify patients who will benefit from interventions. And uh, we can work closely with primary care physicians to have a positive impact on their patients. And you know, there are many ways to do this. Next slide, please. This is one example. So this is actually uh, uh, data from um, a private laboratory in Florida. And uh, what it show, uh, looks at is a number of the uh, billing codes and so forth. But what they were able to do is look at um, a significant population of patients in primary care uh, who were diabetics and had their traditional sort of blood work drawn. And what they were able to do through the analytics is demonstrate how many patients were identified as having abnormal hemoglobin A1C levels and um, uh, and abnormal fasting glucose is by the lab alone. And I, uh, I, I've not included this, but they, what they can do is through um, interacting directly with the patients through text messaging, emails, and so forth, or a phone calls sometimes, is directly contact those patients with the, with the results um, and uh, with the, keeping the primary care physician in the loop at the same time. Next, can, please, next slide, please. And then came COVID-19. So, you know, uh, a lot of what we had been uh, looking forward to doing uh, earlier this year came to a crashing halt, of course. But then um, along with um, uh, COVID came new opportunities, new opportunities for addressing population health. Uh, I think uh, many are well aware of uh, the, uh, the unsung heroes in lab testing who are doing all of the testing and so forth, but there's uh, actually a lot more going on that we can be proud of. Next slide, please. So in Ontario, um, the theme that I like to talk about, lab medicine without borders, really is uh, true, resonates well with the COVID-19 story. Uh, we've been working through the Provincial Diagnostic Network Operation Center, through the Ontario Health Regional Testing Advisory Committees, and you know, Demo and I chair are co-chairs of the East and West uh, Testing Committees. But uh, uh, there's a number of forums in which uh, lab medicine is involved, and certainly the uh, we talk, always talk about the tests and the platforms. But there's a lot of work going on in the community, in the lab sphere, in terms of uh, so-called 
a front end automation, barcode labeling, getting specimens barcode ready and so forth uh, from the analytical component and the test turnaround, the reporting. Uh, believe me, we got a lot of work to do. We're, you know, all you have to do is pay attention to news or even not to know that we're not there yet. We've got a lot of work to do for sure. But this is an example where um, prov by providing laboratory services uh, by hospital labs in particular, providing a lot of the overflow from the, uh, from the pu public uh, health labs and so forth, we are able to um, help uh, the community to uh, deal with COVID. Next slide, please. One of the areas that uh, we think is worth uh, considering uh, uh, is uh, point of care testing. So much has been said about uh, Health Canada and many of the other tests that are out there that, you know, uh, that may be amenable to uh, doing testing on the spot instead of uh, in the big labs. Uh, but somebody has to provide oversight of that. These are not plug and play instruments. You know, uh, we're talking about some fairly sophisticated uh, laboratory technology that goes into this. And uh, interpretation of the results, performing these results, we know in the hospital setting requires a lot of we know in the uh, uh, community they require at least as much attention. And I, I, I'm uh, encouraged by the uh, directive that was issued a few months ago, which allowed infection control practitioners in hospitals to work in community uh, settings. And, uh, and I think that uh, similar directives could allow uh, hospital laboratorians to work in the community to help with some of this oversight of point of care testing. Next slide, please. So lab physicians without borders. So this, the, the, you know, of course, we all know about Médecins, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, Physicians Without Borders. And, you know, I, I, I think this is a nice analogy. I mean, this is actually from uh, New York, uh, where pathologists uh, in the early days of the crisis in New York City uh, did other things. They uh, didn't have surgical pathology slides to look at. Uh, they were doing other things. They were on the front line, but their expertise in lab medicine made a huge difference in the way that patients were being cared for and uh, cared for very well. And this is a very nice story published in CAP today, which I would encourage you to read. Next slide, please. So I want to turn and, and talk a little bit about the primary care link. So where I would like to see us move is a closer linkage building new bridges with primary care so we can have better outcomes. And the uh, areas that uh, we can provide better care are listed here in part. Chronic disease management. I've given diabetes as an example. Uh, uh, I like to think that um, even the small biopsies that are taken in doctor's offices, uh, you know, endometrial biopsies and so forth, skin biopsies, uh, especially with the... Uh, uh, coming of uh, digital pathology that we can provide uh, timely service to community physicians. Uh, and um, I think that will be a big uh, move forward. Appropriate test selection. Tests are getting, there's more and more tests coming every day. Which one is the right one to order? Uh, test reports are becoming more and more complex. As we move to molecular, how will family physicians be able to interpret that? Can we help? And it's access to other lab resources. We, we, we may be the ones, we do that every day in the hospital setting. Why shouldn't we do that also in the primary care setting? Next slide, please. So um, I didn't make up this diagram. I found this in, um, on the web in uh, uh, one of the, um, hospitals, websites, I won't say which one, in GTA, which has developed a very nice uh, OHT already. Um, and uh, I put this up uh, for illustration purposes to show where the province of Ontario seems to be moving, you know, and it's a bit of a moving target. We may not be quite there yet because of uh, what's happened with COVID. The whole idea is you know, if we have a solar system, the, the patient and the family is at the, the sun, not the hospital. 
And that's the simplistic way I like to look at things. If the patient and family are truly providing patient and family-centered care, then how do we uh, uh, reach out uh, to support that care? And I would make the premise that as more and more care goes ambulatory and as more care leaves the hospital, those of us working in the hospital setting better wake up and realize that, that we need to get uh, into the uh, community sphere uh, for the betterment of patients, but for our own uh, survival as well. Next slide, please. Actually, I prefer this slide. This is a simplistic, uh, simpler slide, also from, uh, by the way, another hospital which has developed an OHT already. This is not my diagram, but I have inserted the lab medicine component into it. I like this because I like to think that this, uh, and this really highlights what I uh, uh, talk about as integrating care through the spectrum from primary care to secondary care, tertiary and quaternary care. We can be omnipresent in uh, our delivery and uh, not just within the boundaries of the four walls of the hospital that we serve. Now, of course, there will be uh, uh, issues with some of this. And if you could move to the next slide, please. There are barriers. So, uh, so how do we do about this? I'm sure many of you are thinking, well, that's all nice pie in the sky dreaming. Well, I, I, I think that let's dream big and let's see if we can solve some of the problems that uh, come across us. If we uh, can uh, address some of the issues, of course, there's some funding issues. Of course, we have to be uh, enabled so that we can provide this care. Maybe it's bundled care, maybe it's some other model, I don't know, but we need to talk about that. Of course, there are other stakeholders involved. There's the commercial labs and public health labs, and we need to find a, a, a soft spot where, or a sweet spot where we can all find it. In doing uh, the concept of hospital labs without borders, without walls, it's not about boiling the ocean. We're not talking about taking all the business from all of the communities. Uh, we can't possibly do that, but we can provide care to our OHTs for sure. I believe that uh, what we do need, though, is real-time, very robust data analytics that tell us really uh, what we really need to know as opposed to reams and reams of data. We also need information systems that reliably and effectively communicate or connect hospitals with primary care physician offices. And, and I'm sure my colleagues uh, in primary care, including Dr. Elaine Ma, will speak to that uh, very strongly, that that is one of the biggest uh, roadblocks that we face. And we also need training and skills. Uh, population health management is not something that we've been taught in school. I think it is something that we can easily pick up those skill sets and we can uh, learn the science behind it and apply it better. Next time, next slide, please. So I'm coming to the end. I, I really want to just uh, say that uh, you know, to move this thing forward, to for physician leaders to uh, break out from their border, so to speak. Uh, you know, I feel like in the George Bush era, you know, create a coalition of the willing. Uh, but really what we need to do, uh, we realize that not everybody will be on board, but let's, let's talk to our colleagues. Let's talk to our administrators. Let's talk to folks in Ontario Health and let's see if, uh, make them realize that our involvement is critical, not only to the lab survival, probably all to the hospital survival. Imagine a hospital that doesn't have a lab. We can't have one. Uh, we need to make those advocacy arguments. We, we need to be in the strategic plan uh, in population health management. In our hospital, in Kingston, I can tell you we are, uh, population health is in the strategic plan, but nobody's ever really thought to involve the labs. It was put in there for other reasons, but I'm making sure that we get heard uh, and that population health includes not just the usual things that people might think of. We need to create fertile grounds uh, to sow the seeds, to get people on board, and then we need to develop a business plan to make this work and show ministry and government officials that this can work. Next slide, please. So in finishing, uh, I'm optimistic. I think the long-term value proposition for lab medicine is sound. 
uh, with a proviso that we focus on improved patient outcomes and we don't uh, get into the bu business of uh, uh, just simply the day-to-day -day, uh, service that we provide. We need to up our game. And by improving patient outcomes, we will improve health systems outcomes. We need, uh, we, we, uh, the lab is an integral component of every care pathway. Therefore, we are well placed to add value and well into the community sector, i.e. beyond the walls of the hospital. And as laboratorians, and I use this term, uh, this broad umbrella term, uh, intentionally to include uh, not only those of us who are MD laboratory physicians, but also my colleagues who are uh, uh, laboratory scientists as well. I, I do believe in the big tent and we need to include everybody in all of this uh, to enable primary care providers to provide uh, better service beyond the borders of our hospital. And uh, I, I just make the plea, let us be bold and let us be innovative. Let us think, uh, think big and uh, be innovative. For sure, we face a lot of regulatory barriers, but I can tell you, I listened to a webinar by the Minister of Health last fall, almost a year ago, in which she pledged to uh, bust the barriers if they would help to integrate patient care. So I would take her at her word and we need to do our homework to make the case. Next slide, please. So that, uh, I think that's a slide. Um, it, it doesn't need me to say anything. Uh, I do think that uh, we do need to uh, move ourselves and uh, not uh, sort of have our heads buried in the sand. And last slide. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna turn this back now, I believe to our moderator, Zach, to take us to the next steps of discussion. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Sanda, uh, Sangupta. That was a uh, you know a great presentation. Really enjoyed uh, you know some of the provocative you know thoughts that you have shared with us. And uh, you know, it's my pleasure now uh, to you know expand on this and introduce our panel. Uh, before I do that, however, I do want to also acknowledge and uh, share some thanks to. Some of our organizers for today, that, and that includes Sarah Courtney from Grand River Hospital, Heather Campbell from the Waterloo Wellington Lynn, and Dr. Dimo Devaris, also, uh, who was our uh, introducer earlier uh, from both St. Mary's Hospital and uh, Grand River Hospital. Our panelists, uh, I'm quite pleased and excited to introduce our panelists. And uh, to begin, I'm uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Simpson, who is Vice Dean Clinical at Queen's University, part of the Faculty of Health Sciences and Medical Director of the Southeastern Ontario Academic Medical Organization. He is also an affiliate scientist with ICES at Queen's and a member of the Queen's School of Policy Studies. Uh, he founded the Heart Rhythm Program at Kingston General and served as Professor and Head of Cardiology at Queen's University. So welcome to Chris. Secondly, we have uh, Mr. Kevin Empey. Uh, Kevin is currently providing advisory services to the Ministry of Health, Hospitals and Foundations. In 2016 through 2018, he was the provincially appointed supervisor of Rockville General Hospital. Prior to that, Kevin was president and CEO of Lake Ridge Health for eight years and earlier had executive roles at University of Health Network, Peel Memorial Hospital and St. Michael's Hospital. In 2016 and early 2017, he chaired the Healthcare Sector Supply Chain a Strategy Panel for the Government of Ontario. And we also have uh, Dr. Elaine Ma, who is a family physician in Kingston and Frontenac Islands. She is the lead physician of Frontenac Doctors, which is a family health organization, and a primary care representative for the development of the Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington, Ontario Health Team. She is also the co-chair of the Primary Care Council and the physician lead for the Kingston COVID Assessment Center. Now, during the presentation that uh, we all had the pleasure of uh, uh, observing uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Sangupta, you know, you, you touched on a number of really uh, important aspects with respect to the transformation that we're observing within the health system. And particularly, you touched on the concept of value 
and your definition of value, which focused on the ecosystem performance, the outcomes, both from a patient perspective as well as the system perspective, access to care, patient satisfaction, and of course, factoring in a uh, cost. You then uh, describe the, the, the need for us to look at how we can consider improved service level capability with utilization management, population management, and, and, and cost optimization. And then challenged us with a question specifically, what will be lab medicine's role in healthcare transformation? And you've provided us with examples from chronic disease and those at risk, and recognizing that labs are an integral component of all care pathways. So the first question that I will uh, pose to our uh, panel, uh, the first question will be to Dr. Chris Simpson. And this, this question uh, does build on the concept of health system transformation uh, that we've been experiencing for the last several years. The development of Ontario Health and Ontario Health teams is intended to advance the integration of health services within geographical regions, including hospitals, primary care, and community. So the question is, what's the role for laboratory medicine within this transformation? And should this be driven by the acute care hospital sector or community providers or alternative? What are the risks and benefits to the proposal uh, with respect to lab medicine? So Dr. Simpson, I'll turn, turn the mic over to you. Well, thanks very much, Zach. And um, it's, it's a very complex question, of course. Um, but I think that the best way uh, to think about it is to um, think about how uh, our landscape, our healthcare landscape, is different now from, say, 50 years ago when Medicare was first conceived. So 50 years ago, uh, the average age was uh, much lower. Uh, it was uh, a healthcare system that was really largely about illness care and acute care in particular. Um, uh, the typical care experience was you got sick, uh, you went to the hospital, and you either got better or you died. And, and it was a, it was a very uh, transactional sort of system. Uh, today, of course, the landscape is one of chronic disease. And uh, we have uh, 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 demographics that have changed dramatically. Uh, the, the typical patient now who has uh, heart failure for, uh, has a, an average of five other comorbidities. And so it becomes increasingly um, impossible, I would say, to, uh, to conduct the business of healthcare uh, as uh, a transaction or even as a series of transactions, which is arguably what we're trying to do. So the whole concept of integration is to try to move us away from this transactional environment where we do a task uh, for a patient and produce some sort of a result and try to imagine uh, an ecosystem where a typical patient experience goes across many different providers, many different venues, and navigating many different problems. And of course, we're trying to tackle upstream as well as downstream things and provide a cradle to, to care kind of, uh, uh, cradle to grave kind of care. So it's an extraordinarily complex environment. And I think one needs to advance the argument that we simply can't be transactional anymore. And so uh, I'm, I'm using that word because Sandip used it. And, and I think this is where lab medicine uh, is, is well positioned to transform itself. Um, as uh, a group of healthcare professionals uh, who have arguably provided you know, outstanding care, but in a transactional matter, just like uh, all the rest of us have, and now have a key role to play in the advancement of, uh, of integration of healthcare. Um, one of the advantages, I would say, uh, politically, that uh, other specialties have had is that they've been able to tie themselves very closely to the patient experience. And um, uh, where there has been political influence, it's because uh, patient narratives have, have tied back directly to the provision of care that their surgeon provided or their family doctor provided. Uh, or their cardiologist provided, um, but you know nobody ever talks about the anesthesiologist that that uh, uh, put them to sleep for their for their uh, surgery, and nobody talks about the lab professional uh, who did outstanding work behind the scenes to deliver top notch care to help inform the decisions that were made. So, um, so I think you know this is an opportunity for lab medicine to take its rightful place. 
uh, in, uh, in an integrated system uh, to very clearly articulate what the value proposition is and to frame it in a way that is not about uh, the health uh, professional themselves or the specialty itself, but here's what I bring to the collective effort to deliver a better integrated care experience uh, to, uh, to Canadians. So maybe I'll stop there. Thanks, Dr. Simpson. Uh, really love the uh, the concepts that you brought forward with respect to you know the the fact that we need to move away from transactional care and and really look at the continuum, uh, as you've indicated, from cradle to grave, and and the integration of all of our partners who who touch on uh, delivering that uh, quality and, and patient outcome. My next question is uh, uh, for uh, for Kevin Empey. Uh, Kevin, from a, from a financial perspective, I'll, I'll ask a question uh, for you. Hospital budgeting for laboratory services uh, has been an ongoing cost center despite the fact that these services are so essential, as we've heard today, to a broader audience of health service providers to provide timely and quality care. How can or perhaps how should hospitals compete to deliver service excellence in clinical quality against independent organizations that are providing you know, uh, similar services uh, for laboratory uh, within the community. Um, thanks for that. There, uh, I say there's two different parts to answering that. One is budget itself, and uh, secondly is the system. Um, there are lots of independent labs, a couple of major ones in Ontario, the scope, the scale of what they're providing doesn't tend to be as comprehensive as what goes on in hospitals, certainly as in the major teaching hospitals. And that detail gets lost, so therefore hospital labs can look expensive. But secondly, as, uh, as Sandeep said, we tend to look at labs as transactional and this kind of big black box that just provides an outcome rather than treat it as an integral part of the surgical team. As Dr. Simpson said, you know, an anesthetist is a critical part of, of the team that, that patients might see for their pre-admit, but then not realize afterwards. But an awful lot of surgeons treat their pathologist as a critical element of the surgical team as well. We need to move the rest of lab to be treated that way. So even within an institution, that the clinicians and the team see that there's a value, that there's something that is being bought, being purchased, and how can that value, how can that um, outcome contribute to us not only diagnosing the patient, but managing the patient journey. So I think uh, one is you can, I tried when I was at UHN, put in a complicated billing and recovery system, which drove everybody nuts. So we treated the lab as a variable um, cost on top of the variable activity. But if you don't necessarily need to go to that complicated a system, but you need the lab to kind of get out of their offices and become a more integrated part of the clinical team, then the value is seen by the relationship with the individuals as much as anything else. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, you know, I think the you know the comments that you make certainly with respect to scope and scale and the comprehensiveness is uh, you know a clear message that uh, would likely apply to to all uh, you know acute sector hospitals. Uh, I'm wondering, perhaps, Kevin, if uh, you know before I go on to the next question, if you might reflect on uh, you know considerations that you might make if you are approaching this from you know, a large hospital, you've had lots of experience in, in those types of institutions, but perhaps maybe some of our smaller or more rural hospitals perhaps that don't have the same uh, sort of structure and same uh, uh, community competition level for some of these uh, services. How might they approach it differently? Um, I don't know that it's actually that much different. Uh, as you mentioned, I was supervisor in Brockville and I've done a, a a couple of reviews for the government of medium-sized hospitals and and lab and the connection of lab uh, to the community is always one of the conversations. I think if you look at what our government's trying to do, they're trying to control costs. What is are the, uh, let's call it the canaries in healthcare? Well, hospitals are expensive, patients want to be at home, and we have this these intermediate stages, long-term care and retirement homes, where 
COVID has drawn an awful lot of attention to the problems in servicing them. Those, whether you're in big metropolitan areas with a big teaching hospital or whether you're in smaller communities, those are the exact same problems. And, and I think what the way we need to, to treat lab, um, these hospitals have uh, the problem of how do they help their clinicians manage their patients better? And if you're in, and uh, I mean, uh, the other panelists might argue with me on this, but I, my simplistic theory is if you're a, a GP that's in a major hospital, you're using the major hospital lab to order tests. If you're a GP out in the community, you're using the private labs because we hospitals cut off your access to using our labs. So the continuity of information and having multiple clinicians being able to manage that patient gets lost. And that's a bigger issue for the smaller, medium and small hospitals because they're very, very reliant for, on clinicians who are out in the community. So we need, to, we need to help clinicians be able to get better diagnostic information to manage the patients to keep patients out of the hospital. Terrific, and that's a great segue into my next question for Dr. Elaine Ma. Um, Dr. Ma, from a primary care perspective, what does your vision of, of the hospital laboratories without walls look like, and what might it take to achieve that? Thanks, Zach, and thanks to each of you for taking the time to you know, really talk about this and how we can integrate. And thank you for including primary care. I think there's simple things and there's bigger things. Right now, when we look at how we in family medicine access laboratory medicine, it, it's very clunky. It's very 1990s and certainly does not help us with integrated care. So right now, if I want to order something, I write it down on a piece of paper. Uh, I may or may not fax that piece of paper over to my private lab that's located in town because I can't order something at my hospital lab, even though I have privileges and have admitted patients there. And then that patient goes to the lab and then somebody else types back in the information about the, both the patient and what I've ordered. Not um, at all, not in uh, having technology help us. Uh, and in fact, things that are very expensive. I made reference to the fact that I cannot access hospital lab tests. So I, for instance, do obstetrics and I'll discharge newborns. I would love to be able to access a, a newborn bilirubin to be ordered at the hospital rather than a community lab where they're not used to doing blood draws on babies. I can't do that. So instead what I have to do is I have to send them to see a pediatrician in the eMERGE department who will then order it for me. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, then on a bigger scale, I'm thinking, well, I want access to all the results. Now, Connecting Ontario has, has gone a long way. And, you know, as I jokingly say, OLIS, the Ontario Lab Information System, is my friend. And I use it multiple times every single day. And I certainly notice those days when it's not working. But I have to know to go. There's nothing that's pushed out to me. So having true integra integration may mean that we're on one EMR. I would love to see that that happens. I'm not convinced it's going to happen, at least locally. But if we had seamless access to those results where we didn't have to go to another system and log in. So I'm fortunate I work on an EMR that actually has OLIS integrated, but many of my colleagues locally do not. So they have no access whatsoever to any results. So if you have a patient that went to the eMERGE department last week, maybe had a creatinine drawn, and now you're needing a creatinine because you're refilling their ACE inhibitor, all of a sudden you're reordering it because you don't have access to it. And, and that doesn't make sense from a system standpoint. We're doing a lot of duplication. It doesn't make sense from a patient standpoint. They know they just got blood drawn. Uh, and it, it's something we can do. But I think even bigger, I want access to people who are experts in what the labs do. So right now I base my knowledge on what I order and my medical school training and my two years of family medicine residency and, and then my six years of experience. But what I don't know, I don't know I don't know. So what I want is advice about what to order. What I want is access to the lab specialist who can help me interpret the results so that I'm not trying to figure out, well, what do I do with this result? Maybe it's something I ordered and of course I broke the rule of never order what you don't know how to interpret. 
or maybe it's something that somebody else ordered and now it's fallen to me and I, I don't know how to follow that up. So I think when we talk about taking away walls, we talk about both the logistics of what we do, the access to testing so that it can be done funded or not funded, um, regardless of what environment I work in. And by that, I'm referring to tests that if I order in the community, the patient gets charged, but if they're ordered by a specialist to the hospital, the patient does not. And then also that piece of knowledge, because I think that's the biggest bang for our buck on how we can actually integrate care, is if we bring our lab specialists into the circle of actually providing patient care, which you do, you do every single day, many, many, many times a day, but bring that into the circle with primary care, I think we can be both better clinicians and run a better system that is more economical as well. Thank you. You, you know, you've raised a number of, uh, I think, you know, hot uh, buzzwords, you know, I would say they're not, not buzzwords, but, you know, key concepts uh, within your uh, discussion and, uh, you know, reflecting back, you know, some of your early comments, you know, the clunkiness, the fax. I hate to take a show of hands right now, how many people still have a fax machine that they're using uh, right now. But you also referenced the 1990s. And, you know, I think, you know, I reflect back and that was a great time, some great music. Um, and what you're talking about in terms of access to experts and advice, you know, I'm thinking about this transition and, and I think about, you know, in the 1990s, we probably all had the technology where we make a great mixtape, right? We're seeing that in some of these old movies that are coming back. Um, but what we have now, instead of creating a mixtape for our road trips, well, now we have Spotify. And to your point that you made with respect to access to experts and giving you that advice, well, the way Spotify works, of course, is it allows you that integration. You can have your music wherever you want. But on top of that, they give you advice. Here's some new music. Try this out. And I think that there's lessons that the healthcare system and medicine can take from other industries in terms of technological advancements, where we can hopefully someday very soon completely ax the facts and move on to integrated technology with e-referrals and you know more integrated OLIS within our EMR. Um, you know all wonderful you know recommendations that you have uh, suggested. And we heard earlier from Dr. Sengupta about you know some you know, uh, particular needs in chronic disease and the impact that we've seen in diabetes and, and lab tests for things like A1C. My question to you as a primary care uh, clinician, you, you did mention obstetrics, but I'm wondering, are there other prioritized patient groups that we could perhaps prioritize or start with, you know, to get the ball rolling uh, where we could have an immediate impact on the clinical practice and clinical outcomes for primary care clinicians where, you know, real frustrations that your colleagues are feeling that, uh, you know, if we could only do this, what an, what an improvement that would make for my clinical practice and my patients. So some may say that the chronic disease management will be a priority, things like diabetes. I would actually argue that we know how to manage diabetes really, really well. And we actually know what we need to order for diabetes. Now, can the labs help us do that better? Can they help us um, with, you know, that patient that falls through the cracks? Because it does happen. And um, whether it be just that they don't go get their lab work, of course, of course, there's a role there. But where I say the biggest uh, impact can be is when it comes to those less certain diagnostic workups because that's where we've started to get advice from other specialists. So now when we go to do a referral using um, the ocean system, for instance, it'll actually give us advice on what imaging modalities should you be considering doing in advance of your ortho work, for instance. Well, I think the same thing can happen with laboratory medicine, where it's what are the indicated tests, what are the tests that aren't indicated in this case, because I think both are equally important. And right now, I certainly don't know of a good resource for that. And sometimes it's the fact that we need to know we can actually approach our lab medicine colleagues and ask, 
Sandeep and I know each other. How often have I reached out? Probably not enough. But by doing a project like this together, now I know, okay, well, on my little, you know, phone, I can text him to ask him, well, let's formalize that. Let's make it something that's accessible to everybody uh, such that that information is there. Yeah, I think sometimes exactly. providing some costing information can be really important as well. And that can have a big impact because I think sometimes people don't realize what's expensive, what's cheap and what's got big impact and what doesn't. And I think all of those things working together, every little bit that we can start working together is going to have impact. And out of that, there's going to be very positive fallout. Hey, uh, yeah, I'm just sending it to everybody else. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, th thanks for that, uh, Dr. Ma. You know, again, some uh, some great follow up points uh, to your earlier comments. Uh, you know, you know, clearly uh, very very um, uh, appropriate with respect to the need for us to collaborate and, and recognize how we can formalize some of those relationships and and uh, be transparent in our communication so that we can get the experts to contribute in the management of our patients. The next question that I have is, um, and this, I think this could be perhaps answered uh, collaboratively by, by the panel or particularly uh, Dr. Simpson and perhaps Dr. Sangupta if you're interested. Uh, the question is, how could lab medicine without borders support an improved or enhanced response to a global viral pandemic? And what could be done better for next time or perhaps even this time as we are current? In a, uh, well, I'll, I'll answer just off the top of my head, and uh, I'll, I'll invite those who know much more than I do to uh, give more definitive answers. But um, one of the things that I think has been an overarching concern um, in uh, the er early days of the pandemic in particular, and um, uh, still now, uh, and I've seen this in my Ontario health role, has been the role that fear has played. And, and fear comes out of misinformation. Uh, and it comes out of uh, blank spaces where there are, are no information and, and people will fill in the blanks. Um, so we, we heard a lot from uh, infectious disease people, some of whom are, are lab people. Um, but what, when there was all this controversy about, and is all this controversy, you know, about uh, the difference between uh, a PCR and, uh, and some of the more rapid tests, uh, Sandip alluded to this earlier, um, there, there seems to be a, a barrier between where the expertise is to answer these questions and to bring, you know, facts to the, to the general public and, and even to the senior decision making levels, you know, at the science table at Ontario Health and, uh, uh, and uh, to those who are reporting up to uh, the command table, uh, to the political figures that are making decisions and, and communicating to the public about this. Uh, lab medicine is underrepresented at, at those tables. Um, so uh, th this is a chance for leadership. I think where where the kind of uh, uh, expertise that is needed uh, is uh, is is not um, you know reaching um, uh, a public facing role as much as uh, perhaps uh, uh, could be the case. So maybe I'll I'll throw that one out there first to start. Uh, thank uh, thanks, Chris, for that. Uh, uh, and Zach, um, I'll take a crack at it. So, uh, if I paraphrase your question, so what could be done better for next time going forward in in the next pandemic? So I would say that um, what could be done better is establishing a solid uh, foundational infrastructure for next time. The infrastructure of people, of technology, of uh, networks. So, uh, and I give an example, you know, we heard in the news that in fact, there was some sort of uh, first alert type system, and I don't remember the details uh, at, the, at the Canadian, pan-Canadian level, which uh, for lack of funding or whatever was uh, shut down and uh, delayed our capabilities of uh, uh, responding faster than we did back in the early spring. So, you know, I think we should take this opportunity now to look at the infrastructure we have. In Ontario, one of the good things that come out of, came out of this pandemic, at least in the early days, is this provincial sort of network of uh, laboratories, public health, hospital laboratories, private laboratories, uh, and the microbiologists that are running them, uh, and working closely together uh, with uh, people uh, in the ministry uh, to actually 
uh, decide who does the testing when. Uh, if you're overwhelmed, can we send some to uh, the other labs? For example, Kingston Health Sciences Laboratory does the overflow testing for the public health labs and so forth. So developing that infrastructure and not shutting it down afterwards, finding a way to keep it open would be good. We need to uh, invest in our people. Uh, and one of the crises that are really can become even more apparent during COVID is we lack skilled people. We don't have enough of them. There's a huge shortage of skilled technologists in the first instance. PCR technology is becoming simpler, but it isn't simple. Um, so we need to invest in those people. Uh, you know, ref once this is sort of settled down a little bit, look at those colleges, look at the university, look at the programs that we need for the future. Where are those skill sets going to be? Um, is it molecular? Is it point of care? Is it miniaturization of technology? We need those sorts of things. Uh, and uh, the other thing in terms of for next time is the network development, you know, um, and uh, getting some of the networks of people, I sort of alluded to this earlier, uh, ready and able to serve next time. In other words, better integration, and this comes to the whole notion of hospitals without uh, walls, physicians without borders. We need to be working in a much better integrated space so that we're all singing from the same hymn book. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, there are a couple questions here that I'm seeing in, in the chat, and, and it uh, builds on another comment um, that we had briefly discussed earlier, and that's you know, when we look at all of the labs, so we've got obviously our acute sector labs and our uh, community and public health labs, but we also have, uh, in addition to the private labs, we also have academic labs. And, you know, throughout this, you know, pandemic, they've largely, if not entirely, been excluded from supporting the, the, the testing capacity. And we're having lots of, you know, challenge from, uh, from folks uh, that are involved in, in uh, coordinating and, and administering the tests. Uh, what, what, what do we need to think about in terms of considering that even, even bigger uh, vision of, uh, you know, full integration within our communities to look at available Slack resources that haven't been capitalized in this uh, situation? Well, maybe I'll start uh, on that one. It's, it's tough because uh, I think um, some of the, I mean, uh, we have a, uh, uh, in Kingston Health Science Center is an academic health science center and uh, is performing uh, PCR testing for COVID. So uh, I'm, uh, I guess, fortunately uh, not in that position, but I can understand that others might be in a different position. Having said that, we have uh, very recently had to rely on um, uh, Queens next door, uh, some of the experienced uh, research people who uh, uh, have PCR expertise, we brought them into the hospital lab to help. Uh, but uh, these are not things that can be done overnight. Uh, the skill sets may be similar, but they're not the same. Uh, the processes and the policies may be similar, but they're not the same. So um, I think uh, we need to uh, look at the actual roles and responsibilities and, you know, um, just grabbed it and recognize that the capacity does need to increase. I don't know if I'm really convinced that it needs to be taking uh, advantage of uh, academic labs that have PCR instruments available. Thanks, Dr. Sengupta. And just a reminder uh, to those uh, uh, not speaking, just to keep your uh, mics on mute. Uh, another question from the chat, uh, and this is this will be uh, given to all of the panelists as well as Dr. Sengupta. Uh, curious to know the perspective with respect to the panelists on the role that artificial intelligence. Uh, and machine learning may play in lab medicine uh, without borders. Um, I'll take a crack at that. I'd be interested to hear what uh, people like Kevin Empey and Chris and uh, Elaine have to say. But 
uh, we're excited. Uh, AI will be a great uh, adjuv uh, an extra tool for us. Um, uh, not worried it's going to take our work away, but it may make our life uh, easier. It will help in, uh, I, you know, I, I was talking with a colleague in radiology, the head of radiology yesterday and a family physician about how we can uh, improve test utilization at our center. Imagine the setting where, uh, and this is already uh, available in places like Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh, where they have a huge informatics department, but uh, uh, using AI in uh, computer physician order entry, for example, if you order a test, um, the system through AI knows what tests you've ordered before, knows the interval you've done it before, knows what the good frequency of testing should be, and spits out that information to you and can put in a soft stop or a hard stop or give you additional information and provides some of the information that uh, Dr. Ma was talking about in terms of help. So help could be real or virtual. And uh, certainly, I, I, I would like to see that part develop. The whole test order entry piece is ripe for AI. And, it, and if, I, if I could add, I think you think of uh, lab tests, they go, as, as Sandeep said, they go into the black box and you get your results. But are the labs doing a lot of trending and analysis on the results that are being generated? and correlating beyond an individual patient to start to see trends in the patient in the, in the population profile that's locally. Parts of pathology, you know, there's already computer imaging that is easily going to replace the pathologist doing a review of, of call low end pathology imaging. Artificial intelligence can help refine that and improve that and enable the pathologist to work on the more complicated case. So I think, I think it is, a, you know, the usual barrier is going to be are our computer systems capable of enough and a, is the infrastructure that a hospital or the province has built have the computing power because it's all going to be data and it's all going to require tons of computer assets. But I think it would enable the lab to um, help clinicians model, help clinicians predict, help clinicians do better analytics and make the lab more capable. Yeah, and I, I would agree with all that. And, and to build on it, I would also see it as a as a great quality improvement tool, you know, to uh, help, uh, you know, develop and refine clinical pathways in real time based on, uh, you know, big data and uh, improve uh, appropriateness. Uh, so uh, lots of potential. Thanks, everyone. Uh, the next question, again, I'll keep this open to all, all of the panelists and uh, interested in your perspectives. You know, we, we know there's a great disconnect between what the business sector, which I would include manufacturing, retail, service sectors, the education system, uh, and public health are asking for and what has been available over these uh, recent months. We are hearing that those who are involved in testing are pushing back on uh, the asymptomatic screening, uh, despite the knowledge about asymptomatic spread that there are too many people coming for tests, creating long lines and wait times. And at the same time, the public is scared. And we've seen that this increased uh, impact and demand is having a, uh, a toll or taking a toll on mental health needs. How can lab medicine uh, support or improve this situation? So what, what should or could we do? Uh, why aren't we doing it yet? And what is taking so long to implement alternatives? Zach, I'll take a first crack at it. So um, one of my concerns with the system in Ontario, at least, is, and I, I see this on the chat, so I think it sort of brings, it sort of integrates a little bit of that, is the regulatory barriers that we face in Ontario. They're truly stifling. Uh, the Lab Licensing Act, for example, uh, those of us that are lab directors live and breathe it every day, try to add a test to your lab license try to delete a test to your lab license. Try to get, uh, for those in, in, you mentioned business and manufacturing, uh, if you're not one of those lucky few uh, private laboratories that have sucked up all of the uh, specimen collection center licenses, there are no more licenses out there for people to do testing anywhere. You can't open up 
uh, uh, put up a shingle and uh, open up for business in Ontario. That's been closed for a few decades now. So uh, this is going to be huge. And whether it's possible or not, uh, if there's a will, there's a way. But uh, we suffer from uh, stifling uh, regulatory barriers. And I get it about the accreditation piece. I'm all in for, for, uh, for all of that. But uh, the regulatory barriers, quite honestly, they stifle innovation. And we can't, uh, we can't move to where we want to be. I, I, I can tell you, out west of Alberta, maybe not a good example these days, but certainly in the US, uh, maybe you call it the wild, wild west, I don't know. But surely there's a sweet spot where we can move. And, uh, you know, we should be able to have a lot more point of care testing available in the community. Why not do that? But it's got to be properly regulated. Why not have uh, the hospital uh, provide care to its family health team? I mean, I didn't get a chance to delve into it much, but. Um, and there's some comments here about, well, you know, 50% of the industry is composed, uh, done by the private health, uh, the private labs, like uh, the big two, for example. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we boil the ocean uh, here. I, I, I do suggest that uh, hospitals could and should provide pathology and lab services for the family health teams that are in their OHT. Uh, and there could be a, uh, a funding model that allows that to happen. I don't see why that couldn't happen. And um, so that still leaves plenty of space for the other players in the market. But uh, my main point is I think we need to, uh, maybe on a parallel track, look at the regulatory barriers that we face in this province that stifle innovation. Thanks. I think, yeah, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, I think you're absolutely right because that that affects the individual lab, but but you also have the the Health Canada dynamic, where Health Canada seems to be very slow to approve new modes of treatment that are being used in uh, Europe to speed up COVID testing, and we're still arguing over it for months whether it's uh, whether it's legitimate and whether it's safe. So we, we seem to have a, we still live in a regulatory framework that is very cautious and very risk averse. And it's probably not something that's top of mind of the CEOs and Ontario Hospital Association when they're talking to the governments. But so it's an area where the lab leaders need to uh, create the conversation about how can we ensure safety, but not tie ourselves in knots because the, the day of, of preventing a hospital from introducing a new test is, is so antiquated uh, and because it's precluding hospitals from advancing care. Thanks, Kevin. So I'm re uh, sensitive and, and, and uh, recognizing the time as we are approaching our, our 1.30 and I do want to have an opportunity for the uh, attendees to perhaps uh, you know, throw a question or two to the audience. Uh, before we get there, however, my one final question very simply is, what are the first steps needed to demonstrate this lab medicine without vision? You know, we've talked about a lot of different uh, uh, aspects that would create value. What are the first steps that we need to do in order to advance this uh, vision? So Zach, maybe I'll uh, take a crack at that and uh, very uh, quickly to allow time for the audience. So um, the one slide I had towards the end, uh, I think would be the first steps. You need to advocate locally. You need to speak to people in your local communities, uh, have those conversations with the CEO, VPs, uh, chief of staff, and uh, make them understand the value of the lab. And uh, I think all, uh, certainly with the OHT concept, uh, we're being all encouraged across the province to uh, start these OHTs. So now is the time. Certainly that's what I'm doing in my environment. I'm speaking with uh, our chief of staff, with our CEO, with our chief operating officer, uh, trying to, I've, I've already got uh, arranged with our uh, planning and communications people to uh, get a forum uh, 
with the primary care leads in our area to talk to them about this, see if they're interested, what do they need, and uh, get those things rolling. So uh, keep it front and center. And uh, if, you can, uh, if you can get people in the C-suite to uh, understand this, then they can do some of the advocacy on our behalf. Yeah, and, I, and I would just say uh, one, one simple sentence, a piece of advice, and that would be to become a visible part of the patient story. Excellent advice. So it's 126, and I would like to offer the opportunity for uh, some of our participants to ask a question or two. Uh, if you have a question, what I would ask you to do is uh, ideally turn on your camera, unmute yourself, and uh, address either the panelists uh, as a whole or an individual member. I would like to ask a question, uh, Dr. Sengupta. Um, I'm Wabi Hamouri. I'm a clinical and a laboratory hematologist in the Toronto area. And now uh, the part two of my question that I wrote was had to do with the similarities uh, there is or comments on your, your what you uh, what you think of the DMT diagnostic management teams. However, a misnomer that might be that Dr. Michael Laposata has been proposing for a number of years. Um, is that part of your model? Uh, I didn't hear any mention of it. So any comments on that? Thank you very much for that question. I did see it in the chat box and I'm delighted that you bring up uh, Michael Laposada's name. For those of you who don't, don't know, uh, Michael Laposada is a clinical pathologist uh, who used to be the head of uh, lab medicine at uh, Harvard, then moved over or became head at Vanderbilt. I think he's at Baylor now. And he's written a lot about diagnostic management teams. He's a clinical hematologist as well. Um, well, he practices lab clinical hematology. And basically he has uh, a team of fellows and residents who are on the ward, essentially doing ward rounds with clinicians and uh, basically talking about the uh, value of laboratory testing uh, on inpatients, and probably you may do it in other settings too. I would love to be able to do that. As uh, Dr. Simpson has said, we can surely get visibility do, by doing that. Uh, you know, we uh, now have uh, a new, uh, some new colleagues uh, coming into our department who have some interest in doing that, and I'm highly encouraging of, uh, them to try those sorts of things. Uh, you know, transfusion medicine is a great example in, in our center where uh, our, we, we've been playing a greater role. We hope to do so even more with the new transfusion medicine physician starting in the new year. Uh, but there are many spaces in even in our own within our walls for, uh, that we can provide that kind of uh, diagnostic management teams type setting. Maybe for the interest of time, I'll I'll uh, stop there. But thank you for that question, Dr. Zar. Yeah, great question, great answer. Uh, I think we've got time probably for one more question. I see that we we're, we're maintaining the majority of our participants, so time for one last question. Hi, um, this is uh, Ipshida Kak. I apologize, I don't have a webcam on my hospital computer, one of our IT limitations. But um, I just had a uh, quick question, and I think uh, Dr. Joshi, I see Suhash Joshi um, is uh, in the chat also referencing to um, something similar. Um, is that um, just within labs themselves, we have so much diversity um, you know, in the type of labs, the hospital labs, the academic setting, the community setting, um, the um, commercial labs, even before we go into lab medicine without borders, um, how do we uh, ensure that all the different participants in different labs that are going to have, you know, their own issues uh, with um, participating in this, how do we ensure that everybody is at the same level, that, you know, it is not... Uh, a solution that doesn't work for someone. So uh, Dr. Cock, thank you very much for that question. And maybe I'll just take a quick stab at it. Uh, 
you know, uh, I think uh, through the OMA section on laboratory medicine, which is co-hosting this webinar, uh, we can start some of that work. Um, uh, we, uh, I always like to make, uh, take the expression, uh, we need to tend to our own backyard also. So I would encourage you to do what you can in your own backyard, so to speak. But uh, it needs to occur at a grassroots level. It needs to occur at the provincial level. We need to engage OMA, OHA, others. Uh, what you suggest is highly important, but not accomplishable overnight. But we need to uh, have the leaders at um, all levels to, um, to start that conversation. Uh, I'd be happy to talk with you offline about that some more in detail. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. If it is uh, permitted, can I speak for about 30 seconds? This is Suhas Joshi. Go ahead. Okay, I think, you know, uh, first and foremost, thank you very, very much for Sandeep and Demo for presentation and for all the panelists. I think a great presentation and great discussion. And certainly I have been involved with lab section for very long time uh, and also with uh, OAP lab, uh, and uh, so on. So, you know, there are lots of issues and I think it's a great opportunity. And particularly if you look at it, what this COVID has done has uh, provided us with big challenges. And when there are big challenges, there are big opportunities and big solutions. So I think, you know, we have right now what appears to be uh, a complex structure in which there are academic hospitals, big community hospitals, small hospitals, and then there are cent uh, centralized commercial labs. Before they used to be in all communities, now they are centralized. So how do these fit in o uh, OHTs? I think that's something that we need to look at. Uh, there are very complex uh, functions, but primarily we are in, uh, doing preventive diagnostic management and prognostic things. We want to make sure academic and research is addressed. However, it comes back to the thing, how do we uh, make the best use of our healthcare dollars and how we treat patients in a best way to pr uh, prevent the delays in testing, delays in reporting and delay in treatment. And that all can be achieved in coming up with networks, remo removing all the regulatory challenges that exist. And uh, you know, this could be one of those situations where as we get into influenza challenges and all those things coming up, if our local labs somehow can be strengthened to stand up to the challenges, we can meet it, we can exceed it, and we can bring value to the labs, uh, lab services. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Sandeep, for presentation, great presentation, Lab Medicine Without Borders, uh, lab, section on lab medicine and Ontario Association of Pathologists. Uh, would really like to reach out you know, to all those people who, um, want to get our help in making a very robust lab medicine system for Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. That was a nice summary, uh, bringing back the, uh, some of the concepts from the presentation, uh, with, particularly with respect to uh, value. Uh, at this time, uh, I, I certainly would like to thank all of the panelists, uh, Dr. Elaine Ma, Dr. Chris Simpson, uh, Mr. Kevin Empey, as well as our presenter, Sandeep Sangupta. And I will turn things back over to our, uh, our host, uh, Dr. Dimo Devaris. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Zach. Um, this time I've got the mute button on, um, off, so uh, sorry if I missed the, uh, the initial introduction. Um, so again, um, I, I, I really like your comment there that you made, Zach, uh, laboratory, mes uh, laboratory medicine with a vision. I, I think maybe that's a, a, a new slogan. So uh, I thank you for that. Um, again, I just want to thank um, Sandip for the great presentation. My sincerest thanks for the panelists, um, uh, Chris Simpson, um, Kevin, and Elaine Marr. Um, really, really grateful for, for your time and uh, wonderful comments. And I would also just like to say thank you to Heather Campbell, Maggie Irving, um, and uh, you know, who are uh, managers, I think, in their respective uh, health integration networks for helping um, uh, put this uh, meeting together. And also a big uh, thank you to Sarah Courtney, who is our regional coordinator here in Waterloo Wellington Regional Cancer Program. Thank you for all your help. 
And again, uh, thank you to Karen Bell, um, who is a testing lead in Ontario Health West, who has really been an invaluable sounding board for both Sandup and I, uh, as we prepared for this uh, webinar. And also to Kathy Begedja, who's the executive administrative uh, assistant uh, for the OMA uh, section. Um, so uh, this uh, brings um, this webinar to a closure. And again, my sincerest thanks to all the registrants uh, uh, who, who uh, participated in this event. So with that, have a great afternoon and thank you once again. All the best.